If you have your Bibles, please turn to the Revelation chapter 9. This is uh, some pretty intense stuff. Uh, probably, possibly one of the most disturbing chapters uh, in this book, though they all get disturbing from here on out. But uh, we, we finished up last time where the Apostle John writes, Whoa, whoa, whoa. We use that today, don't we? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Right? That's, that's, a, that's a biblical idiom that, you know, I, I, I loved it when Tim was here, Tim Barton, and he showed us all those idioms, you know, skin of your teeth, between a rock and a hard spot. I, I mean, all those things are biblical. And, uh, and this is whoa, whoa, whoa. It, everything progressively gets worse and more severe as we go on. The first four trumpets, and then we have three left. And so uh, we're going to read first to start with through, through uh, verse 12 uh, here in, in chapter 9 from verses 1 through 12. And let's pray. Father, thank you for this word that is, uh, Lord, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And uh, Lord, when you say it, um, we are to believe it. And God, I just pray that as we look through this and, and uh, Lord, just see those things uh, that really apply to our lives personally. And uh, God, that uh, just as Justin was saying, that there is a, it's a, there's a sense of urgency, Lord. And I pray that you would place that in our hearts, Lord, that time is short and that your return is imminent and it's soon. And so, Lord Jesus, help us to be ready and help us to uh, glean from these verses this morning. In Jesus' name, this afternoon. Sorry. Amen. Uh. <laughs> okay, here we go. You ready? Verse one. Here we go. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And so the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke los locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek it has the name Ap Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. And so it starts here with, the, with the, a star. It says, and the fifth, the, excuse me, the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fallen from heaven, a fallen star. Now we know that stars can be mean messengers. It can mean angel. Um, we remember when, when it talks there, I believe it's in chapter 12, when, it, when Satan is cast and it, with uh, his tail, he grabs a third of the stars or the heavenly hosts or the angelic beings. And this is an angelic being. It says, not that he was falling, that he is fallen. Right? We know that Satan is a fallen angel. And so um, it says that he, and he, it says, and he gave him... It was given the key to the bottomless pit. This is in the, in the Greek, abuso. This is the abuso. This isn't, this isn't hell. This is a, this is a, a place of incarceration. Um, and so he was incarcerated, uh, or 
demons, many believe, were incarcerated here. He gave them a key to unlock it. Now, a lot of people get this confused because it, we see again in chapter 20 of Revelation, right, that, that uh, an, an angel is given a key, and along with the key, he is given a chain. In fact, I think I got it here. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him. And so he, he seals this pit. So this is a different angel. This angel actually has the key to lock it. But this angel that's here, some think it's Satan. That folks, listen, like, like we've been saying, we haven't seen anything yet. It appears even now that demonic activity is getting more and more frequent, right? It's just, it just is. Uh, they're just, they just stir each other up. And we know that the, the, the demons rule in, in they're very territorial. Years ago, I heard Dr. Walter Martin. Who remembers Dr. Walter Martin? Anybody, any old people remember Dr. Walter? That is pathetic. <laughs> Dr. Walter Martin, the Bible answer man. He was, he was incredible. I listened to him all the time. He wrote a book called Kingdom of the Cults. The guy was brilliant. They said he had a, a is it telegraphic, a photographic memory that he, he, he memorized so many huge portions of the Bible. He was an incredible man. He had this, he had this kid call him, this college kid call him one time. And he says, hey, you got to tell me. The kid was from somewhere in Oregon. He was going to school in Montana. He was driving through Idaho. He said, he called Dr. Walter Martin. He, I think it was kind of a family friend. He says, you got to tell me something. He said, I was driving through Idaho. He says, when I hit Twin Falls, he said, there was a darkness that came over me. He said, and it was, he said, it was, it was thick. You could feel it. You could feel this. It was just an oppression. And he said, and it didn't lift until I got into Montana. That's because it's all Catholics up there, right? <laughs> but he said, what was that? He said, well, you are in what we call as Christians, we call Eastern, Southeastern Idaho is, is the heart of Mormondom. It's a spiritual stronghold. It is, in fact, folks. It is a spiritual stronghold. And, and the, 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 the spiritual hosts of wickedness are very territorial. Man, they get their hooks in. And that's why when people start messing around with, with Ouija boards and seances and, and occultic stuff, it's like... You know, where it says there in Revelation that Jesus stands at the door and knock. When you start messing with that, those things, them, them demons stick their foot in the door. You can't get it closed. And so, um, they're real. They're alive. And more and more, throughout the tribulation period, there's going to be a demonic activity like the, the world has never seen. Except, except, maybe, maybe, like the times of Noah. You remember when Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. You remember what's happening there in Noah days, Noah's day, right? That there was violence. There was, it was just, uh, it was really intense stuff. And, and it, was, it was spiritual. And in Genesis chapter 6, verse uh, four through six, it says, and then there were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the heart of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. It appears the sons of God always throughout scripture is connected to angels, right? In this case, it would be fallen angels. The sons of God saw the daughters of men. Many believe that these giants were like a hybrid, right? That there was a genetic manipulation. And many believe that as we get closer to the coming of the Lord, there's going to be this genetic manipulation. Maybe very well be demonic. It probably would be demonic, right? Because demons, what do they seek? They seek embodiment. They seek 
embodiment, right? The demons there at Gadara, they didn't want Jesus to just cast them out. In fact, it's inter- one interesting thing is they bowed down and they worshiped him, right? Listen, when it comes to this spiritual darkness, God has Satan and his hordes on a really short chain, right? That just comforts my heart, right? They can't do nothing to me that he don't allow them. to. God keeps them on a short chain. But these, the, it, it was so bad that God had to send judgment, right? It was so bad that he had to send judgment. And it says that they were, they were actually imprisoned. Second Peter Chapter 2 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be uh, reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, as a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who was opposed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Oh, excuse me, I missed a verse there. The turning to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. That God brings his judgment on these things. And then those, those demons here, it appears that he imprisoned them. Right? He put them, he locked them up. Because otherwise there would be no chance for mankind. Then again, it it talks about it in Jude, verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And here's this angel going and he unlocks the bottomless pit, the abuso. He unlocks it. And it says there, again, the key was given to to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke rose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air was darkened because of the smoke of the pit. A lot of darkness going on here, ain't it? Remember last chapter, there was a third, right? A third of the sun was blocked out, a third of the moon, a third of the stars. That just kind of goes hand in hand with the demonic, right? You see that even with people. That's, we, he, we, That's how we describe them sometimes. They're so dark. It's just a darkness. But Jesus is the light of the world. Praise God. And so he says, So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came up on the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They are commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So here these demons are released, but God puts parameters on them what they can and can't do. And that, to me, is just so wonderful. I just don't want to be that person that God says, hey, have you considered my servant Scotty? You remember that, right? Job. So they're given power as the power of scorpions. Now there's a little gray scorpion over in the Middle East that I've heard. They say that it has the most powerful sting of any creature on earth. That... that Though a lot of people don't die, you feel like you're going to die. And so these, uh, these locusts have, have a sting in their tail. And it says they were, so they were given power, right? Power. Uh, they, they were also given the, uh, the restriction that they could not hurt the vegetation. We remember the last chapter, they did hurt a third of the vegetation. So God said, you can do this, but you can't do this. Now... A lot of people think, why would God, why would God allow any of this? Anybody ever ask that question? Why would God allow this? This is, this is so, it's so terrible and so wicked. Well, listen, the world at this point is getting what it wants. Is getting what it wants. They want a world, the world and the world system, they want a world system without the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The world hates him. He said, don't get all upset when they hate you. They hated me first. 
The world hates God. They want to do away with God. I remember as a kid, right, hearing about taking prayer out of school. I had some rebel teachers, some rebel public teachers, public school teachers, that would read the Bible and pray with us kids, right? Mrs. Wright, I know her crown is shiny. <laughs> she was my fifth grade teacher. She read us a chapter of the Bible every single morning before we started school. It was awesome. But, but they wanted it out, right? And it's, it's funny. It, it, didn't take, it didn't take very much pressure to get that out of school. Get prayer out of school. Get Bible reading out of school. Don't put the Ten Commandments out in public for crying out loud. People might read them and obey them. And if they do, it'll cause brain damage. It is, it's, <laughs> if it wasn't so serious, it would be laughable. It's just, it's just, it's crazy. Oh, you can't, you can't tell kids that to not. These people must not have ever ha raised any kids, right? No, you tell them not. And a lot of times you tell them not, but then you have to give them a few nots. <laughs> So he gives them power. He restricts them. They can't, they, they can't hurt the vegetation. But notice, but their aim is the earth dwellers, right? They're going to go, they're going to go seek and destroy, right? Isn't that what, what Satan's ploy is, right? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that is, that is their aim is to destroy uh, the people who don't have. So maybe this is people who have actually been converted throughout this tumultuous time and have surrendered their life to Christ, that God somehow puts a mark on them, that they can't be hurt by these. And it says, but they didn't have the authority to kill them. Right? You can hurt them, but you can't kill them. Right, man, that's what he said to Job. First, he started with his possessions. Satan says, oh, you've so blessed Job. You, you put a hedge around him. I can't get to him. Right? I can't get to none of his stuff. He says, you, he's got this hedge and you've protected him. He says, I'll tell you what, you take that hedge down and you let me take everything he's got and he'll curse you to your face. God was pretty proud of Job. Right? He was pretty proud of Job. Sure enough. Talk about a bad day. You read that story of Job and all of them lost all his kids, lost his servants, lost his cattle, his donkeys, his sheep, camel, whatever he had. It was all gone. And he never cursed the Lord. Oh. Then he comes again. Right? Satan comes again. I'm thinking <laughs> Job was probably going, come on, Lord. Not the first time. Good enough. We got to go here again. He says you can. He says you can touch him, but you can't kill him, right? You remember the boils that he was scraping with the pottery and all that stuff. Here it says, so they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any green tree, but only those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them. For five months, their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. In those days, men will seek, to, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. This, this is fascinating to me, right? Men will, it's going to be such a torment that people are going to want to die. I mean, I've seen people in torment where they wanted. In fact, my mom talked to me the other day. She said she prayed through the night that the Lord would take her, right? Because she's being tormented. I remember, I remember Wilbur, Voltoff, saying, I, he said those words, I just want to die. I'm done. These guys will have that same attitude, but can't do anything about it. Death will flee from them. Can you imagine people trying to take their own life and your spirit stays in your body? Death is a fascinating thing, isn't it? It's, it's a bit mysterious. 
right? Because we don't know. You know, we know what the Bible says. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But that separation of body and spirit, when you're, because when, when you watch people die, the evidence of them leaving is powerful, right? They leave. They, they exit the premises. I mean, it is, it is a real thing. And it's, it's a very powerful thing. But to imagine that, that that spirit doesn't leave that body. And here it is and just decimated, you know, whether whatever people try to do to themselves because they desire death, but it flees from them. And so then it gives a description. It's interesting. He, he, uh, they have the, the authority to torment them for five months. That's the lifespan of a locust is about five months. And uh, it says, and the shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had uh, hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle people say, okay, what is this? We don't know, right? Well, it sounds like a helicopter, right? But it looks like something out of Narnia. Um, there's a lot of takes on this. People think that, you know, that, uh, that they, maybe it's a battleship that he couldn't really, uh, obviously, they didn't have engines back then or things powered that way. But even what we have today with the drones, right? And, and the drone attacks that are going to, they're going to amp up too, just saying, right? They already are. Over in the Middle East, it's very common that the, the, uh, many of the terrorist groups are using drones to attack. Um, but I'm convinced that these are just creatures. They're creatures that... that uh, I guess, or a physical body for these demons to inhabit. And um, there's some uh, different commentators, right, that have different ideas about this. Henry Morris, who I highly respect, he said this, there seems to be no alternative to concluding that God, satisfying the age-long desire of those wicked spirits to possess bodies of their own has created bodies for them, bodies appropriate in demonic appearance to the character of the demonic inhabitants. Unique creatures they are, empowered by demons. They are. It's as though there is a horde of them, and they're coming uh, at the, those who dwell upon the earth to, to torment them. And so... Uh, notice it says like. It doesn't say they're horses. It, it, it says like seven times. Like horses, like gold, like the faces of men, like hair of women, like lion's teeth, like uh, uh, sound like wings, and like, like iron. It's all like. It doesn't mean that it's those things. But uh, John Corson's take on it was this. I'll just throw this out there. Uh, horses being symbolic of power. Gold being uh, symbolic of a position or a person uh, of authority. Uh, the faces of men would be symbolic of intelligence, right? Uh, demons aren't stupid, right? They're, they're smart. Uh, hair, a woman, the Bible says that the glory of a woman is her hair, uh, could be uh, seductive. Teeth, devouring flesh, iron, not easily defeated. And sound would be intimidation. So... Whatever they are, they wreak havoc on the earth. These, these creatures, these, these locusts. And so, um, no tell uh, what they're going to be. I know I just don't want to be here to see them. And it says... Verse 10... And they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men for five months. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. 
Now, it's interesting because locusts don't have any king. It tells us that in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 27, it says the locusts have no king, yet, but they go forth, uh, they go, excuse me, they, but yet go they forth, all of them by bands, right? So they just get together and they go. They don't have a king, but these do have a king. They got a commander. Many believe that in the demonic realm that it's rank and file. Right? That there's, there's high-ranking demons, right? There's, there's imprisoned demons. There's, there's uh, you know, just kind of your mediocre guy that can't get his black wings. I don't know. Uh, but there seems to be ranking demons. And we're, we'll, we'll, we'll maybe see some of those later on. But it says that their king, it says, uh, whose name in the Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek, he has the name Apollyon, right? Both those names in the Greek and in the Hebrew means destroyer. Well, we know who that is, right? That serpent of old, that, that destroying angel, Satan, and that, that is who, who rules over them. And he tells them what they, they can and can't do within the realm, the parameters that God has established. And he leads them. And we know that later on, it, it goes from bad to worse. And so it says, one woe is past, behold, two, still more, two more woes are coming after these things. And so you have to ask yourself, right? Who are you serving? You remember the old Bob Dylan song? You got to serve somebody. It might be the devil. It might be the Lord. You got to serve somebody. I don't do a very good devil. But his point was very good, right? You've got to serve somebody. Who, who are you serving? Because it is obvious that people, right? When Paul talks about it in, in uh, Acts chapter 26, the people are under the power of Satan or they're under the power of God. And who is that power in your life? Because I think, I think churches are filled with people who are Satan's little pawn, right? Just a little pawn. And he can move in their life however he wants. If they're not pressing in, if they're not, not putting on the whole armor of God, right? Which is, which is so powerful, the breastplate of righteousness, that helmet of salvation, right? The sword of the spirit, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The, the whole armor of God to fight against this stuff, folks, that is coming up on the earth. And it is just fascinating what's going on right now, right? With Russia and with Iran and, and in Israel and in the, there in Saudi Arabia and around in Yemen and that, just the wildest things, the United Emirates and, and, and China, you know, talking about genetic manipulation, they say China is actually genetically manipulating their soldiers. They're trying to create a super soldier. And you're thinking about, uh, you know, years ago when they, they cloned the dolly, the sheep, and the cloning is continuing. And, and if there's no conviction of what's right and wrong, and in a communist country, we know that Satan is king, just like he is of these angels. What are they doing? What kind of hybrids are we going to see? Right? I mean, we're, we're, we're getting to that place uh, really fast. And, you know, I, I know I sound like a broken record, but man, if there is ever a time to be walking close to Jesus... <laughs> It's yesterday, right? <laughs> if you're waiting till today, you're a day late. For sure. He talks to him in Ezekiel chapter 33, 11. He says this. He says, but say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye. This is old King James, right? From your evil ways, why will you die, O house of Israel? Turn. We need to turn from our wicked ways. We need to seek the Lord and have him 
search us, right? Search my heart, O Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amos chapter four, he tells Israel, prepare to meet your God. I was just, a friend of mine called me the other day. He's, he was asking me about my mom and her condition and we grew up together and I did his brother's funeral and his dad's funeral and his mom's in an Alzheimer unit. And he said, I feel like, a, I feel like an orphan. Right, his family's pretty much gone. When he sees his mom, she doesn't know who he is. And, and, um, and we got to talk and I said, oh, he said, he said, I remember you saying at George Juker's funeral about 10 out of 10 people dying. I said, yeah, <laughs> 10 out of 10 die. 100 out of 100, 1,000 out of 1,000, keep going, right? We're all headed towards a grave. So it's not, it's not that if we die, but when we die, are we prepared to die? That is the bottom line. Because it's, it's uh, people are going to get really used to it here. You know, and, I, and in the first, you know, there in, in chapter six and stuff, there's going to, like I was, I was saying, there's going to be a lot of funerals. But for five months, there's no funerals. Right? Because death flees. People can't even die. What torment that's going to be. So it's just, just important to, to be ready. To maybe even today, just get your heart ready before the Lord. And just, just stay in that place. I mean, it could be a habit change. It could be a geographically move. You need to move. I don't know what. But just get right and stay right. Because the Lord hears us. Right? And uh, I had an opportunity to get through my prayer list this, this morning. And I don't usually do that on Sundays because I'm just busy kind of getting ready for this, this message. And, and, uh, and I, was, I was getting through my prayer list and I, 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 had, a, I had an urgency in my heart that uh, I don't have a lot. And many of you are on that list, you know. Um, but, uh, but I'm just thinking... I don't do this every day. I don't, I don't get through my prayer list every day, but I need to, right? Now's the time. I need to be doing it every single day. I need to be pressing in. You need to be pressing in. We need to be drawing close to the Lord in these times in which we live. Psalm 34, 17 says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. If you haven't been crying out, start. Husbands, are you grabbing your wife's hand and praying with them? I remember years ago, Pastor Gordon said, you know, a lot of the people I counsel, they're a lot, they're a lot more comfortable taking their clothes off in front of each other than they are praying in front of each other. I said, you've got to be kidding me. He said, no. Why, why is that? Is it because we, we make ourselves vulnerable? Well, come on, make yourself vulnerable, right? Peel your old hard heart and, and open and soften it up and pray with your wife, pray with your kids. Because we have that true enemy that Jesus talked about there in John chapter 10, verse 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And can I say, and bless his family, like the Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You and your family will be saved. Verse 10, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And we can have it right now. Right, right now. But it's about drawing close to the Lord like maybe we never have. As a body as an individual. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Right? With urgency, we should seek his face. 
Verse 13, and the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound in the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Wow. Right? So first, a horde of demons is released, and now these, these must be the big dogs, right, that are in the river Euphrates. You notice, if you look throughout Scripture, the river Euphrates, there is always connection to wickedness there, right? Uh, it, the river Euphrates is clear back in Genesis, right? It was, it's there close to Babylon. Uh, it was the boundary, right, for the nation of Israel that, that God was going to give Abraham, the and here's these four angels. But they're just bound right there in the river. I don't know how they're chained. Maybe chained down at the bottom. They've been blowing bubbles for two, five, four thousand years. And here they are released. And know what they can do. They can kill a third of mankind. These first ones just tormented them. These are going to kill them. And the funerals will resume. Now, many people who hear this, they get a bit undone and um, they, they are afraid and they think that they don't want to see this. I don't want to see this. Who in their right mind would want to see this? You want to see this? Right? Jesus said, pray that you be worthy to escape these things that are coming upon the earth. That's what I'm praying for. I want out of here. And I plan on it. I plan on getting a ride out of here, either in a hearse to a cemetery or through the clouds in the rapture. That's what I plan on. And so uh, when I read these things, you have to always keep that in mind. Always keep, right, the pre-wrath, the pre-wrath position, right, that we were not appointed to the wrath of God, the Bible says, right? So, so God's going to snatch us up out of here. But these dudes, uh, th these angels, uh, they're, they're just bodacious, these four angels. It says, now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. I have no idea what these are, right? Are these, are these just bodies, again, that God allows these, these, uh, these, these demons to control? I don't know. Pretty fascinating, 200 million. Some, many believe that this was China over the years, that they actually had a 2 million man army back in the 60s. China did. Had a 200 million man army in the 60s. And yet... Uh, Though two of the colors are there, the, the third kind of color kind of throws people off. They don't know. It could be a coalition army, right? You think Russia and China coming together? That'd be freaky, right? I sure wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. Would it surprise you the way things are going right now? Their heads were the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed, right? Notice, it was the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone. These are the plagues that kills people. Verse 18 Maybe that's 19. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like the serpents having heads. And with them they do harm. So wild creatures again. I looked up horses, so it can't be horses. I was hoping it would be. I was hoping it would be. But there's only about 160 million horses in, in all the earth. Around, around the globe, about 160 million million horses. So that's not it. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by those plagues did not repent. Do you imagine pe seeing people die around you? Uh, but I noticed, I noticed uh, 
watching people die brings a hardness to your heart. Uh, I, I went into the COVID ward over here at, at Mountain View the other day, and because I was a pastor and it was a it was a end of life situation, they'll let me in, and so I got to go in, and um, and pray with this guy. And I was I was shocked when uh, when I talked to the two nurses about about this guy possibly uh, dying. It was just like it was just like he was a piece of meat laying there. It was no biggie, you know. Just know, it's like, it's the, the value of human life is seem, seemingly going down, down, and down. And we know that's coming, right? So is there going to be a, is there going to be a great revelation to the world where human life is going to, we're going to elevate it, the sanctity of life and, 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 and celebrate the sanctity of life? And I don't think so. I just, I don't think so. I think, I think... Uh, we're, we're, I think we're at the point of no return. We're headed towards the rapture. It's going to come. That's what we should be excited about, right? Uh, encourage one another, right, with, the, with, this, with this hope. Uh, but they did not repent of the works of their hands, and they did not, uh, that they should not worship demons, right? Idol worshipers. The New Testament tells us that behind every idol is a demon. So when people bow down to a certain little image, uh, there, guess what? <clears throat> His foot's in the door. His foot's in the door. A demon's foot is in the door. And idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. The things that people bow down to is fascinating to me. Rick said when he was in, when he was in India, they were walking around this square in, in, in this town. And he says, to look in, into the eyes of some of the Indian people, he said, you've never, there's such an emptiness, right? There's just such this hollow, it's, it's like they're walking dead people. And he, they were walking around this, and this, this rock got kicked. It was a pretty big rock, and it flipped two or three times and landed and leaned up against this wall and was leaning against the wall. He says the next day when they came back around, that rock was still there, and there was this huge shrine around it. And people were bowing down before this rock. <laughs> Old Testament and New Testament, it says, listen, these things can't talk. They ain't got no hands. They can't help you. They got feet, but they can't walk, right? They can't. They got voices, but they can't. They got mouths, but they can't speak. They got ears, but they can't hear. They got eyes, but they can't see. And you're trusting in them? Not only that, but people steal them. How would you like to have a God that could be stolen? Right? Remember when Rachel took Laban's gods? <laughs> you stole my gods. Well, that's a pretty lame god if he can be stolen. <laughs> Which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, of their sexual immorality, and their thefts. Right? Their murders. What about, think about nations. Think about nations that have committed murder. I heard one report in, in Russia. The, aver the, the, the woman, average woman at 35 years old has had a, between three and four abortions by the time she's 35 in Russia. It's just rampant. The killing. The murders of nations, Right? Ruth Graham used to say, if God doesn't judge America, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology, right? And they won't repent. They won't turn from murdering. They won't turn from sorceries. It's the word pharmakia in the Greek. It means drug use, right? People are just popping. The, the pharmaceutical drug abuse is, is it's terrible. It's in the church, right? People are just hooked on stuff. Now, there may be some stuff that's necessary, but not a lot. And their sexual immorality. Think about that. Think about that in our country, in our young people. Men in, in their marriages committing adulteries on their wives with their phone. And they won't repent. Oh, I've seen some. You know what they usually do? They chuck that baby. Right? Kind of like Kirk Cameron in Fireproof, right? Takes the bat. 
goes to town on his computer, he is addicted to pornography. They won't repent. Do you have a desire? Do I have a desire to repent? That's one way you can tell when people are really walking with God. Take King David, for example. That guy showed us how to repent, right? He was a scumbum. But man, did he know how to repent and get right with God? Oh Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. And they're thefts. How about the thieving of that of, of nations as well? I heard somebody's talking about this. Just all the things. How nations just cheat their people and other countries. And it's just, it's thievery. And they won't stop. Repent means to stop. Right? That's what that means. It means turn, change course, change direction. Repent. And they would not. I don't know about you, but this scares me. It scares me that my heart could get so hard that I, I could come to that place where I can't say I'm sorry or I can't confront a fault in my life. I don't know if that scares you, but it should. There are things that we need to confront in our lives all the time. Repentance is a lifestyle, folks. It's not just a one-time thing, right? It's a lifestyle. And I tell people, the older I get, the less I sin, but truly, truly, the more I repent because I'm more aware of my fallen condition now that I'm getting old. When I was young, I didn't see it. I'm like, oh, I'm a pretty good guy. But now that I'm getting old, I'm thinking, oh, wow. And the Bible says as we get old, we get more corrupt. Now, many think that, well, that's just talking about the body decaying. Well, yeah, that too. <laughs> but... Isn't it true? The older you get, the more aware you are of the faults you have, right? And the sin we commit. He who knows to do good, James tells us, and does not do it to him in his sin. This is uh, some pretty sobering stuff, but I pray that the Lord will find uh, fit to just challenge you. You know, Paul told the Corinthians, he says, listen, examine yourself. Examine yourself and see whether you be in the faith. Self-examination is really good. It's kind of scary at times too because the truth does hurt. But it's good. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much this morning, for this afternoon, for your truth and your power. Lord, that you, uh, you're truly on the throne. You... Uh, Bring us to a place of searching our hearts. And Father, I just want to praise you that you, uh, you're going to rescue us. Lord, I just pray that uh, as you told the children of Israel, prepare to meet your God. I just pray that every one of us in this room would be prepared for that day. Lord, that we would never lose sight of that day, actually, when we live our life living in a way knowing that uh, this thing comes to an end. And I just want to be ready. And I just want everyone in this room to be ready. And Lord, you've given us all the tools we need to um, live this life. Uh, everything that pertains to this life and godliness, Lord, you've given us. So I pray that we would draw on those things. I pray for some today, they may need to ask you for salvation and invite you to come into their heart, maybe to have that moment, Lord, where they've said, they say yes to you. Maybe some would need to ask you for your Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you and empower you. And Lord, I just pray that, uh, Lord, as we go from this place today, Lord, that we would realize that this week you're gonna give us opportunity to be salt and light. Just having a man remind me this week, Lord, that it's what we're all to be. We're all to be salt and light in this world. And so, Lord, help us to do that. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.
that save a wretch like thee. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but Bless you guys. If you need prayer, come on up.